Hello, welcome to Scott's Odyssey. Today I'm bringing you to a story that I've been working on for over a year and keep putting off just because of what it entails. Uh, to date, this is one of the most emotional and difficult stories that I'm going to relay onto you. And quite honestly, it probably will not give you all the details and credits where they are due. Today, we are in South Fork, north of Johnstown, and we'll be talking about what happened on May 31st of 1889. See you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. I honestly don't even know where to begin with this story. There are a lot of variations and a lot of finger pointing with essentially nobody taking direct accountability. And honestly, when you look at all the information, the result of what took place here truly was the hand of providence, or for those of you who need smaller syllables, an act of God. Were there people who should have been more accountable? Well, yes and no. Were there facts that pointedly showed that something bad would come in the future? Again, yes and no. With all of that, let's get into the story, and I wish for you all to remember that this story is about us, not a time in history when something was different than it is now, because everything that happened at this time can and most assuredly will happen again. It's what makes us who we are and who we once were. The date was May 30th. The location, the Connemaw Valley, which comprises itself of a large portion of the Connemaw River and a bunch of small rural living communities, as well as a couple of very large cities. It was literally the heart of the iron industry in Pennsylvania. On this day, there had been a significant amount of rainfall, but the difference in this rainfall was where it was coming from. You see, most rainfall that hits the Connemaw Valley comes from the west-southwest. The weather pattern pulls moisture and temperatures down from Winnipeg in Canada and then goes through Minnesota and picks up some more moisture from the Chicago area, drops down to Columbus, Ohio, and then goes back up into the northeast to the Pittsburgh area through State College in Pennsylvania before it goes due east to Philly. But on this day, there was a lot of extra moisture in the air that had come from a rogue storm way to the south. That rogue storm was a Category 1 hurricane off the eastern seaboard that collided with Georgia and then it fell apart as it went back out to sea. What made this rogue hurricane odd? Well, it was the first ever hurricane to be recorded in the month of May, and since then has only happened three more times in our history. Why is this significant? Well. May is the rainy season for Pennsylvania, and a big storm with a lot of pressure behind it would cause a wall that would prohibit an eastbound storm from going east. That means the one coming from the west was put into a position of stall directly over Pennsylvania. The storm was wet enough to cause minor flooding throughout the valley, and most definitely enough to totally saturate the ground so that it could no longer absorb water. Meanwhile, at a private and elitist hunting and fishing club, some interesting backstory was at play. 14 miles north of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a 61 member property called the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club was going about its merry little way. The club was so elite that it only gave membership to the extremely well-to-do financially and industrial and political people who kind of ran Pennsylvania during that time. It had a clubhouse that was on the lakefront with 47 rooms and where the members stayed during season. And when it was off season, they would stay in one of their cottages, just back off the lake and out of the view of prying eyes. Now, I say cottages, but these buildings were typically three stories tall with about 15 rooms each. A special feature of South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club was 
It's lake. The lake was made by the largest man-made earth dam in the United States, creating the largest man-made lake of over 450 acres. The lake size was one mile wide, two miles long, and 60 feet deep, and it was held back by an old dam. It's at 14 miles away and 460 feet, or 33 stories higher than Johnstown. The dam itself was built and later abandoned 20 years before the club was ever established. The building of the dam was by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as part of the main line of public works. Its purpose was to act as an overflow spillway from the canals that used to go through this area. During the 20 years of abandonment, almost none of the previous owners, such as Pennsylvania Representative John Riley, a Democrat in Congress, performed any maintenance on the dam. As a matter of fact, before selling the surrounding property to the club, it was Congressman Riley who sought to make financial gain and had the five cast iron tow drains to the dam removed so he could sell the metal as scrap. Congressman Riley sold the property to entrepreneur Benjamin Franklin Ruff, who had sold the idea of a private club to many different elite investors in the city of Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, Ruff was not a waterway engineer, regardless of his steel train rail engineering background, and was unable to drain the lake properly for the repairs that were in need to be effected. Then there were the modifications Ruff had done to the dam. In order to keep their high quality and professional bred game fish in the lake, they placed screening before the spillway that would stop anything except for water from leaving. That is, stop anything except water until the screens clogged and ended up adding more pressure against the dam. In addition to blocking the spillway and having no tow drains, three to five feet of earth and stone was removed from the top of the dam in order to lower it so that the members could drive their carriages across to the other side. But still, Ruff was not to blame. He was doing what was making his clients happy and well, he died several years before the dam broke. When signs of weak spots arose, such as soft spots or leaks on the downstream slope, they would send out a group of groundskeepers to fill the holes with rocks, dirt, and manure. With the lowering of the dam by so far, the top of the spillway was now only four feet below the top of the dam, which exposed the top of the dam, which was designed to flow water into the spillway, with a significantly increased chance of failure should water fill the lake faster than the spillway could discharge it. You see, the weakest part of any earthen dam is the middle. If the water flowed over the top of the dam, then all of the dam that was not designed for spillway would be almost immediately washed away and cause enough weakness in the structure for a complete breach. Club member Daniel J. Morell, the general manager of the Cambria Iron Company and Republican congressman during the 40th and 41st con Congresses, had joined the club after losing a handful of top-notch employees to his competitor and also member of the club, Carnegie, in Pittsburgh. His other reason for joining was in order to keep an eye on the club as well as what things they may be doing in their fiefdom territory above Johnstown. One of his first endeavors was to get a formal inspection of the existing dam in 1880. Ruff was met one morning by John Fulton, Morell's chief engineer and geologist. The damage caused to the bottom of the dam by the removal of the tow drains was apparently never dealt with and was confirmed to not be spring water spouts, but rather the lake percolating up from underneath. Fulton also identified that one side of the dam was being gouged away by running water from over top of the dam. The other modification made to the dam, such as the fish screens or the lowering of the dam's height, were never disclosed to Fulton by Ruff. The dam was determined to be a disaster waiting to happen, and Morell offered to compensate the club 50% of the repair cost in order to immediately remedy the situation. Ruff replied with a scathing, no, and Morell was removed from club membership. Back to May 30th, 1889. As the rain fell, the rivers all climbed at one foot per hour and the rain had no end in sight. Johnstown began to flood due to the rain not being able to run into the river and creek fast enough. But most citizens of Johnstown were already used to the occasional flood in the streets covering everything with a couple of feet of water. 
not too dissimilar to the people who still continue to rebuild homes along the tornado alley or along the Florida coast in direct lines with hurricanes. Trains coming down from South Fork were stopped because the rains were too heavy and the river was rising far too quickly. Just northeast of South Fork, the Bear Run had washed out over a quarter mile of track. In short time, all trains were stopped where they were and no trains were moving east or west along the rails. That was when a new issue kicked off. Telegraph lines in the area were inoperable and the track men that were available were to walk the lines and find where the issues were. Between May 30th and May 31st, South Fork Club Superintendent Unger, who had taken the place of Ruff after his death a few years earlier, noticed the lake had risen over two feet and was increasing by one inch every 10 minutes. He also witnessed that the spillway was almost completely blocked with debris and was unable to handle the amount of water that needed to be flowing over the dam. When walking the dam, Unger took note that almost every quick patch of stone, mud, and manure had sprung into a full-blown jet of water. Unger had the dam engineer, John Park, leave on horseback toward Johnstown to get word out that the dam was failing. Unger then had all hands come to the dam in an attempt to patch the holes and raise the height of the dam as quickly as possible. When John Park reached South Fork, he went to the telegraph operator to get the emergency message to Johnstown. Because telegraph and phones were down, yes, Johnstown had over 70 telephones at this time. The message only made it to Mineral Point, four miles down the road. The message read, the water is running over the breast of the dam at center and west side and is becoming dangerous. Pickerel, the telegraph operator at Mineral Point was able to get the message to a passing trackman who walked the message a mile and a half down the line to the a and Tower. The message was then again re-telegraphed to East Conema and Johnstown. From East Conema, the message was sent to Robert Pitcairn's office in Pittsburgh. Robert Pitcairn was a Pennsylvania Railroad mogul and prominent member of the South Fork Club. After receiving the telegram, Pitcairn immediately boarded his private train car attached to the Pennsylvania eastbound passenger train number 18 and left for Johnstown. Along his journey, Pitcairn had seen evidence that this was no ordinary rainstorm and the rivers were high enough to frighten him to his core at what was to come. At 3 p.m., the telegraph lines to Johnstown, Pennsylvania went silent. At 3.10 p.m. on May 31st, 1889, the South Fork Dam tore away from its embankment in totality, releasing all the water contained in a two mile long, one mile wide, and at this time, 80 foot deep lake in one go. That's 20 million tons of water, 565 million cubic feet of water, poured out with a speed of 317,800 cubic feet per second. To put this in perspective, a basketball holds about one quarter of a cubic foot of water. So imagine, if you can, 79,458 basketballs filled with water moving toward you at 40 miles per hour. Yeah, that's real math. There's no joke there. As the water approached East Conema, it had slowed its speed, but not by any amount that would make a difference. Train engineer John Hess ran his train backward on the rails away from the water, blaring his whistle nonstop to warn the locals of the impending danger of a wall of water coming toward the town. Eventually, the wall of water reached Johnstown, and nothing in its path short of a solid rock mountain wall could even slow it down. Every tree, the buildings, railroads, the trains, any existence of infrastructure in its path was instantly wiped from the face of the earth and turned into a piece of this torrent's rage as it continued downstream. About two minutes after four, the wall of water and the debris jumped the banks of the Conema and connected with Johnstown, Pennsylvania, continuing its carnage and adding livestock and people to its collateral wrath. In just under 10 minutes, the flow of water ebbed and the city of Johnstown was no more. The entire city and all of its buildings and infrastructure was picked up, smashed to bits, and rammed into the only surviving bridge of at least six, the Stone Bridge. There was a lot of debris, 
over 30 acres, according to description. To put 30 acres into perspective, that's 23 football fields of debris, 45 feet deep. Four square miles of the city of Johnstown had just been completely wiped from the face of the earth. But the water continued to fill the city for about two hours. You see, the bridge created a jam and the water had nowhere to go. After about two hours, the embankment of the bridge on both sides gave way and the water finally had a way out, giving an opportunity for the newly formed Johnstown Lake of Despair a way back into the Connemaw River. At its highest point, Johnstown found itself beneath 16 feet of water. Now, I said I wanted to tell you a story of the people, so here we go. As witnessed and stated by W.B. Tice, a survivor of the flood, I was again compelled to jump, and after being knocked about until almost exhausted, I reached another housetop, sailing at the rate of about 15 miles an hour, but getting closer to the shore. I again jumped, and a millman caught hold of my hand and assisted me to land. He was terribly excited and could not speak. I helped him to take two more men out. I went up on the embankment and looked across the bridge, which was filled full of debris, and on it were thousands of men women and children who were screaming and yelling for help. As at this time the debris was on fire and after each crash there was a moment of solemn silence. And then those voices would be again heard crying in vain for the help that came not. At each crash hundreds were forced under and slain. I saw hundreds of them as flames approached throw up their hands and fall backward into the fire. And those who had escaped drowning were reserved for the more horrible fate of being burned to death. At last I could endure no more. There are several dozen stories from those who witnessed these horrors. This is not the only one. I chose this story because it was the one that hit me hardest in my core. You see, while researching all of this, you, you tend to forget that these were people, just like us. And to give you a higher view of what Tice was saying, it, here are some facts. 2,209 human lives in Johnstown alone, including 99 total families and at least 396 children died. Over 322 men and women were left widowed. 98 surviving children were now orphaned. One story even speaks of a man who lost his wife, his father, and his eight children. One in every three bodies found, 750 in total, were victims who were never identified the schoolhouse, the Catholic and Presbyterian churches, and the local saloon became the morgues. Bodies were found as far away as Cincinnati, Ohio, over 400 miles away, and as late as 1911, 22 years later. Relief efforts for this disaster were stalled, and emergency events went into finding and collecting the dead. In a three-day period, the telegraph lines were back up and the rails had been reassembled, and even a couple of viaducts had been rebuilt. One of the first messages sent from the Johnstown area to Pittsburgh via telegram was, send us every coffin that you can send. On the fifth day, a young woman named Clarissa Clara Harlow Barton arrived with her new formed disaster assistance group called the Red Cross, their first major crisis engagement. When the coffins arrived, a new level of solemnness fell across this former great city. As stated by J.J. McLaren, the coffins were stacked around the morgues, on the pavement, and at the railway stations. Many were as small as violin cases for the great army of babies and young children. As the trains brought coffins and the beginning relief efforts, the second wave of trains brought the world's very first onslaught with what would now be dubbed a media circus. Mass media portrayed the incident much like a movie being released or the rumblings of war in Europe, which was to come, feeding on who could better alliterate a fanciful or rhyming headline to one-up each other, instead of telling people what happened and how they could help their fellow man. Not to mention the hounding of the survivors, whom were still in hope that their wife, husband, or even their child survived somewhere out there beyond the debris. Making matters much worse was the consistent perpetuation of lies by the mass media, speaking of 
heroes, heroines, villains, and victims, just to sell one more paper and sway the public to their side of thinking, and even having living people pose under debris as if they were a dead body. Not much different than what they've been doing for the past few years. As for heroes, heroines, villains, and victims, each and every person of Johnstown who did not die were all of those at the same time, and more than any of those choices, they were survivors. For the expedience of the disaster's recovery and ability to inter as many of the day's old bodies as possible, a single unidentifiable victim of the flood was chosen in order to be autopsied and represent all of the other bodies to be pulled from the havoc. The findings for death was death by drowning. When the lawsuits arose of who was to blame, the courts ruled that it was the hand of providence. Now, does this mean that there were not a lot of things that were done that may have prevented all of this? Most indubitably, but it was not just the dam that was an issue. Since the Great Flood, there have been several other floods through Johnstown's history that have been far worse, but have had fewer lives lost. I, for one, do not believe that fixing the dam would have stopped this flood, not with the way they were building them even in 1889. Does this mean it would have lessened the flood if the dam was fixed? Probably, but still not by as much as we would like to believe. What took place was a series, a large series, of bad choices and mistakes that chained together in one very long cascade of systemic failure, much like what is taking place in the United States right now. Even after the breach and flood, although an immediate investigation by the American Society of Civil Engineers took place, their findings were intentionally delayed. Information was, according to a more modern investigation in 2016, whitewashed and subverted and not submitted until two years after the disaster. So do I think the members of the club were bad people? Well, not for the dam disaster. If I had money to burn and went on a vacation to an elite clubhouse in the middle of the woods, I sure as hell guarantee that the condition of the land and dam and lake would be the last thing I would care about. After all, I'd be paying good money to not have to worry about that. So who do I think would be at fault? If anybody for this issue, it was the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for not tearing down the dam after they used it and left it abandoned for 20 years. But even then, that means it's all of our faults based on who we choose to put in office, especially back at that time. If you get the chance, go to the Johnstown flood location on your maps or put it on your bucket list. Remembering the people that came before us is just as important as remembering what happened to them with the decisions that they made. I hope you enjoyed the story of the people of the Johnstown flood. If you haven't already, remember to click like on this video, subscribe to me for some more odd to see stories of who we once were. I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.